Kia ora tato, nga mihi nui ki a tato kato. Kua hui hui mai nei ki tene hui fakanui ma te wiki o te hanganga to te ao o te ao i tene ahi ahi. Kei te mahi i te New Zealand Green Building Council aho ko Tom Furley Toku Ingoa. Nā reira tena koto, tena koto, tena tato kato. Thank you all for joining us today for a slightly delayed World Green Building, uh, World Green, World Green Building Week event. Uh, it is really, really great uh, to have you all, all with us. Today's discussion is part of our Greenspeak Waikato series. And Greenspeak Waikato is a series of events organised by the New Zealand Green Bil Building Council's Waikato Forum, which is a local group of members helping to create local opportunities for better building, knowledge sharing and connections. A huge thanks to our Waikato Greenspeak sponsors, APL and Art of Touch, and to our Waikato Forum partner, Homes Consulting Group. Also, um, a huge thanks to our World Green Building Week sponsors, Temper Zone, Rubik's, Resine, Auckland Conversations, and Jib as well. Now, today we'll be delving into how our communities are responding to climate change. Much has been said about the need to reach our carbon emissions targets set out by the 2015 Paris Climate Accord and New Zealand's own Zero Carbon Act. But at the same time, we're already seeing the effects of climate change almost daily. We're constantly hearing that we need to start to act, and definitely that is the case, but there are also many already trying to do their bit. So today we'll be hearing a few examples of actions already put in place or planned uh, in the Waikato region by different communities, as well as ideas on how the building community can move, can move the uh, built environment towards zero carbon. Obviously today we're drawing on the knowledge and experience of those in the Waikato region, but no doubt uh, there will be lessons and actions underway that mirror or apply to, to the rest of, of our Tikaroa. Um, so today I'm, I'm really thrilled to uh, be joined by Manaki Nepia, uh, Strategy and Relationships Manager at Waikato Tainui, um, Jen Beards, General Manager of City Growth at the Hamilton City Council, Hannah Huggin, Youth Climate and Social Activist with Student Environment Leaders, and Amanda Bryan, Principal Sustainability Consultant at Jacob. So kia ora, uh, welcome, thank you all uh, for your time this afternoon. Uh, we're going to kick things off uh, with each of our presenters uh, giving a brief outline of their work and thoughts about how our communities are and can respond uh, to climate change. And uh, these will no doubt prompt some discussion. So we should have about 20 minutes uh, to, to half an hour to uh, get into some of the, some of the issues and uh, answer any questions um, that you may have. So for those of you tuning in, feel free to flick through any questions you may have for our panelists uh, as they come to mind. There's a Q&A uh, button here on Zoom that you can, uh, can pose your questions there. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's, that's enough uh, from me. So look, I think we'll, we'll kick things off uh, with Jen. Would you like to, like to go first? Yeah, absolutely, Tom. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, kia ora koutou, ko Jen Baird tēnei. Uh, as Tom said, I am the General Manager of Growth at Te Konehera o Kirikiridoa, Hamilton City Council. Um, and look, it's a really interesting time to be talking about the growth of a metropolitan scale city when we're also talking about environmental impacts and climate change in a way from a council perspective we haven't in the past. Um, and over the last uh, few years, I've seen a lot of changes around here in terms of the conversations that we're having and the outcomes that we're driving for the community and particularly in the environmental and climate space. Um, the conversation is very much at the forefront. Uh, when uh, Mayor Paula Southgate was voted in a year ago now, um, she instigated a environment committee which had an express goal initially of coming up with a climate action plan, which we now have, and that's starting to to drive investment decisions um, around council, um, specifically around 
things like um, our biking plan and tra transport infrastructure in the early days as, as short-term um, easy wins for that. Um, but environmental focus really is, uh, is much more a part of the conversation when we're talking about delivering communities as well. And when I say delivering communities, I'm talking about urban regeneration as much as I'm talking about new growth areas uh, for the city. In fact, I've just come out of a meeting where we we're talking about um, the environmental investment uh, for Peacock. Peacock is uh, Hamilton City Council's um, largest current um, growth cell and our largest investment in a growth cell over the next um, decade or so. It's also our largest environmental investment um, ever that the council has made and really wanting to stake a claim on that and make sure that we are meeting the requirements of our community in that space and delivering the kind of environmental outcomes that are expected of cities as they grow. It is not without its challenges and with a growing city, um, with growing demand for land use for all sorts of different things, houses obviously, um, and businesses, but also for roads and for recreational facilities, finding that balance between enabling growth and protecting and enhancing the environment um, and therefore meeting our obligations in a, uh, to, to climate change is really important. and. Uh, it means we have some really interesting and robust conversations um, around the council table. Um, but certainly our investment and focus in environmental outcomes is uh, a, a lot greater than it was. And it's really exciting to see that because it has, obviously it has multiple wellbeing benefits. Um, we're also stepping into a space at the moment where we're talking a lot about density. And in terms of uh, urban regeneration uh, and the new houses that are getting built in established suburbs, Hamilton absolutely leads the way nationally in that space. So just in this calendar year, 57% of all the new homes built in Hamilton have been built in existing suburbs. So not in our new greenfield um, development areas. And that presents its own, um, uh, its own challenges in terms of the infrastructure that we need to enable that up conversation as well as out, um, but also the government is, is handing us um, national policy statements that are requiring us to think differently about it. So it's, um, it's pretty cool to see that over the, next, over the coming years, we, we're going to be stepping into a conversation with our community about exactly what that looks like and how far we as a city uh, want to go in terms of um, turning the dial from a climate perspective. Um, just one other thing that I would touch on as well in the space is that Hamilton has just launched its new um, rubbish and recycling service. Uh, again, not a project that is um, trouble free, uh, but it has been amazing to see how well the community has taken to a far greater emphasis on recycling and waste reduction. So um, I saw some numbers a week or so ago. Uh, it's only been running for, I think this is week five. In the first three weeks, uh, we diverted 315 tonnes of food waste from landfill. So um, that rose from 71 tonnes in the very first week that Hamilton has ever collected food waste to 130 tonnes um, by week three. So uh, really amazing to see that the community are absolutely acting in this direction as well. And from a council perspective, we're really looking to continue to have that kind of conversation with our community so they can help guide our direction. That's probably enough for me, Tom. Excellent. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I know um, as an Aucklander, I would love to have a food waste thing. I think that's a really cool, cool idea. It's something I strangely get quite excited about. But um, look, uh, thank you so much, Jen. And uh, so look, on to, on to you, Manaki. Um, yeah, um, give us your thoughts. Kia ora tātou. Tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, nā mihi nui kia koutou katoa ko Manaki. Ni pia tōku ingoa. Uh, I mahi anau ki Waikato Tainui. I kia ora tātou, my name is Manaki Nipia. I'm the Strategy Relationships Manager uh, within Waikato Tainui and so I have the um, privilege of uh, talking in this forum today and I want to acknowledge um, the other panellists and, uh, um, and look forward to hearing their contribution with regards to this kaupapa. 
I guess one of the things for Waikato Tainu is we recognise that climate change is one of the most significant issues um, that will impact long-term wellbeing and prosperity of our marae, whānau, hapu and iwi, and we will require an intergenerational approach that gives the best of ourselves to create a sustainable future for this and the next generation of Waikato Tainui. Uh, within the context of Waikato Tainui, we have 33 hapu, uh, 68 marae that traverse um, as uh, to Auckland uh, in the north um, and down towards uh, Tekoiti, Manyaputo, uh, we're kind of on the on the verges there, and so we, we have a large, a large, um, fault or well, large beneficiary role within ourselves. We have over seventy seven thousand registered tribal members. So obviously, the conversation for us around. Uh, climate change is not a new conversation. Um, I think for many Māori, uh, uh, climate change has been part of our evolution from the first time of our migration. So when we left our, um, our ancestral lands of Hawaii and made the journey over here. So for those that haven't had the opportunity, I would recommend watching Origins presented by Scotty Morrison. I think that's a, a great... Um, little documentary, I think, to help um, not just our own New Zealanders and Kiwis understand that that uh, the journey that Māori took from that time. So, um, but I guess, yeah, as I said, for, for Waikato Taumi, climate change is not a new conversation and, and we are looking at what that means for us. We have a number of key strategic documents that play a big big role in um, the, I guess, the pathway that we will take. And one of them is our environmental plan, Taitumu Taipari Taiao, um, which is quite a very lengthy, uh, very thick document, I'll put it that way, that we as an organisation are looking at. We designed this uh, document to actually assist our councils and um, developers to apply a lens or a Māori lens or consider a Māori lens when they um, want to look at the development. And so I guess what's poignant around that plan is the plan, the vision for the plan comes from uh, a mamai aroha um, that was derived from the second Māori king, King Tafio, where he laments with a heavy heart his longing for and the adoration of the Taonga natural resources of his homeland during the time of 1863 when confiscation was, was taking place. And I think... Um, I will read you what that mamai aroha is because I think it describes um, from, a, from a Waikato Tainui perspective and from that time, um, what our, our natural environment looked like. So our aspiration is to restore the environment to the state that King Tafio observed when he composed um, his mamai aroha. And that mamai aroha um, uh, reads this, I look down at the valley of Waikato as though to hold it in the ho hollow of my hand and caress its beauty like some tender verdant thing. I reach out from the top of Pirongia as though to cover and protect its substance with my own. See how it bursts through the full bosoms of Maunga Tautari and Maunga Kawa, hills of my inheritance. The river of life, each curve more beautiful than the last. Across the smooth valley of Kirikiriroa, its gardens bursting with the fullness of good things towards the meeting place at Ngārua Wahia. There on the fertile mound, I would rest my head and look through the thighs of Taupiri. There at the place of all creations, let the king come forth. So I think when he lamented that, it was really as he looked back and the beauty that Waikato was. And so for us as Waikato Tonui, we want to aspire to get back to that time where um, food was abundant, um, our biodiversity was abundant, um, and simple things like swimming in the water uh, was uh, just a given. Um, as we all know, given the current situation we have, not just here in the Waikato and not just here in Aotearoa, but across the world, uh, we are fast running out of, of those opportunities to participate in our natural environment. So for Waikato, that, that is, a, is a massive aspiration. And so a big part of the work that we are doing uh, to respond with our marae and with our hapu and our whānau 
is looking at what are these things we can do? How do we prepare ourselves? What, what, what does that look like? So for our whenua, which is a key principle, so our land, the health and well-being of our whenua is a reflection of the health and well-being of our people, our why, our water. Waikato Tony's relationship and respect for our waterways give rise and responsibility to protect the mana and Māori of our water bodies and obviously our whānau. The health and well-being of our ii, hapua, marae and whānau is vital for our own sustainability and prosperity. So we have a number of um, actions, I guess I'd call them, that, that we're putting in place um, to support our marae. Uh, if I take the West Coast, for example, we, we know firsthand we have a number of our marae that are on the West Coast harbours, our Shinkafia, uh, even our marae that are at the lower end of the Waikato River catchment um, that are experiencing firsthand the impact of climate change. And so our marae, uh, I guess, are exerting their own manamotuhake, so their own ability to um, protect uh, the marae, if I take Maketu and Kafia, uh, which is a significant site for us, uh, given that the tiny waka of which we uh, travelled over on, uh, that's its final resting place. But we understand that we are losing land to erosion at a rapid knot. So a big part of the exercise that we're doing with our marae is looking at what, how do we protect what we can, uh, how do we restore what we can, um, to ensure that we maintain those taonga um, for future generations. So, uh, yeah, so we, we've got a lot that we're doing and specifically it is developing our mitigation plans. So working with our marae to identify mitigation plans, what does that look like for them um, and how do we enhance that, uh, supporting our marae to participate in, um, and, and advocate, I guess, uh, at, at a number of levels, at central government, at local government, um, and with other iwi uh, and with other key stakeholders like the Fonterras of this world um, to actually engage in some of those conversations. Uh, and so that's a big part of our, our, our actions to support our marae, increasing the green and blue networks, uh, similar to what Jen talked about around peacocks as a big uh, uh, economic, well, a big development. Similarly for us, along with Hamilton City uh, Council, Ruakura is a big investment that um, that we have a vested interest in um, because it, it is coming out of our commercial arm, Tainui Group Holdings. And so again, we're looking at what does a blue and green network look like in the development of um, this residential potentially uh, and industrial uh, area. So we, we want to enhance what that blue and green network looks like uh, in those developments. Uh, we are also obviously looking at our water uh, in terms of um, for Waikato anyway, it's an over allocation of water at the moment and we have the um, situation that's happening with water care at the moment with Auckland City Council, um, but I'll just leave that conversation, that's a whole different conversation, but I think it's about recognising that we have to think and really seriously change our practices with regards to our waterways uh, and then the headroom we need to create because we are currently over allocated. Um, and so for Waikato, a big emphasis for us is to ensure that if we're going to give rights to water, uh, you know, if we're looking at rights and interests, the rights to water need to go back to water first. And so that's a big part uh, of our, our focus and our aspiration as to how do we protect uh, uh, that resource, which is, as we all know, is becoming quite depleted and rather quickly. And so it's an important part for the tribe to look at what does that look like. Uh, for us moving forward. And as I mentioned earlier, we are looking at our, our, our um, commercial investments and how do we change some of our practice to maintain a balance between a commercial development while also maintaining our kaitiakitanga. So look, I'll leave that there. That's the focus for Waikato Tainui is, is um, moving forward. And uh, yeah, kia ora tato. Yeah, thank you so much, um, and I have lots to get into there. So I hope, um, hopefully, we'll we'll have plenty of time to to delve into some of those areas uh, shortly as well. Um, but look, I'll hand over uh, to you there, Hannah. Um, you know, it's it's great to have 
uh, a young voice, and I guess it's something that has been amplified over the last uh, year or so. So, um, yeah, keen to, keen to hear from you. Yeah, kia ora Tom. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Ildin te maunga, ko Tweed te awa, ko Ngati, ko te Rani, ko Iwi, uh, ko Harauta te waka, ko Maunga Haume te maunga, ko Waipawa te awa, ko Te Aitanga a Mahake, ko Ronga Whakata oku Iwi. Uh, ko Taki Pute Marae, ko Hannah Huggin toku ingoa. So kia ora everyone, my name is Hannah Huggin. I'm a climate justice advocate, so my work is, uh, has a focus on enacting change through politics, um, upholding te tiriti o waitangi, and building stronger communities. So um, I have various roles. I lead the Student Environment Leaders Group. So we organised the strikes. I wasn't the leader at the time then, but we organised the school strikes last year and Jen would have no doubt seen me uh, speaking at council in regards to the climate action plan and then I'm also the Manutaki so I represent the climate action goal for the Waikato Wellbeing Project. Um, I'd first like to begin by thanking the organisers of this event, Tom for the introduction uh, and everyone joining us today um, and of course for the invite I'm very honoured to be here speaking along with um, these other wonderful panellists, so kia ora. Um, Within my, so within my various roles within the community, I've worked with people who are passionate and committed to climate action and, um, you know, through meeting these people and um, who are out there in the community, um, I'm certain that, you know, the solutions for the climate crisis will come from communities and people. Um, in, Waik in Waikato and across Aotearoa, we're seeing tides of Ties have changed within the discussion of climate change as the need for action becomes increasingly urgent. Um, and we saw this recently, as mentioned, with the school strikes and the implementation of the zero carbon bill. And people are really starting to take action and come together because the climate crisis poses a serious risk to our livelihoods, our health, our economy, our uh, infrastructure and, and everything we care about so it's and people are starting to become more aware of that um, and what's important also to acknowledge is that um, Te Ao Māori has continually explained and demonstrated that there's an integral relationship um, between ourselves and the environment and Manaki um, talked about that you know as Tainui that this climate change has been an um, ongoing conversation in regards to the science aspect the requirement to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees is incredibly clear. We need to half our emissions by 2030 and we need to achieve net neutrality by 2050. And the questions we need to answer to achieve that are how are we going to reach this target and how are we going to prepare communities for the warming that's going to come, that's inevitable. And um, as outlined in the 2018 IPCC report, we need rapid, far-reaching, unprecedented changes from all aspects of society. So that includes uh, the construction and infrastructure sector. So a lot of our solutions in Aotearoa are actually going to have to come from the building sector. We need to work to answer questions like, how are we going to build infrastructure and buildings that promote a zero carbon society? Um, one third of New Zealanders live on floodplains. So how are we going to, when we see these stronger and more frequent floods, how are we going to protect these people? Are we going to have to move them? Are we going to have to build uh, infrastructure that will mitigate these effects? And that's a really important question that we can't shy away from and um, it absolves ourselves from respons responsibility to. And, um, Another example is how we're going to protect and adapt to the consequences of the climate crisis. And that, that's a really important question for, for the built environment that we'll see, um, obviously, damage and lack of resources. So, um, and uh, much more holistic things than that as well. Um, yeah, I, I guess these are questions that people are already answering, but need to become um, more mainstream and the solutions need to be implemented in a much more rapid and unprecedented way than we're already seeing. Um, and it's also important to acknowledge that the solutions that strengthen sustainable development can go hand in hand with 
equitable systems. Um, in instances of the outlined questions I've already posed, we can provide people with increased quality of life, security, safety, and independence if we, um, with our solutions to um, obviously the questions that I asked. Um, Aotearoa needs to pursue climate resilient development pathways that achieve sustainable and a just society. And that can be done, the, as I mentioned before, the integral relationships between ourselves and, and the environment means that obviously our ability to sustain ourselves comes from how well the environment is. That's where our resources come from. That's where our livelihood, everything is dependent on the land and surrounding environment. And if we want to create um, a society that thrives, the environment needs to thrive as well. Those two things aren't separate from each other. Um, the, you know, the climate crisis is the greatest threat to humanity, but the solutions do lie in the hands of people and communities. Together, um, we can achieve the mitigation, adaptation and resilience to avoid the worst outcomes. Um, and this can be done only if we act now and answer all the really serious questions. So, uh, Noreira, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that, Hannah, and uh, a really nice uh, note to, to end things on there. But uh, look, we'll jump over to you, uh, Amanda. Um, so yeah, talk us through your work there with, with Jacobs as a, a, a principal sustainability uh, consultant. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, kia ora, everyone. And uh, firstly, I'd just like to thank, uh, do a thank you to the organisers for inviting me along today to talk about how communities are responding to climate change. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the other panelists today. Uh, you know, what a, an amazing group of people based here in the Waikato region. Um, as, as Tom mentioned, I'm a principal sustainability consultant and I actually work across the Australian and New Zealand re regions. Um, however, I am based in the Waikato. I do work on a variety of projects uh, from infrastructure, road, rail, through to the built environment, such as hospitals, existing building assets and sports parks. Uh, so my thoughts that I share with you today are a little bit broader than the Waikato region. Uh, but first, I'm just going to be a little bit of a geek and talk about the science. So uh, what, is it, what is it that we mean by climate change? So we mean a long-term change in weather patterns due to human activities and in particular fossil fuel burning, which increases the heat trapped in the Earth's atmosphere and it raises that Earth's average temperature. So the climate change results in weather patterns changing such as sea level rises, uh, higher temperatures, increased frequency of storms, drought and so on. So in response to climate change and changing weather patterns, what I'm seeing in the industry, communities and projects, and is really three key steps being established. These key steps are resulting in future ready design outcomes that mitigate and reduce the impact of climate change. So these three are things like strategic planning, so an assessment of the climate projections and doing risk screening, developing adaptation measures to mitigate the climate change risk. And then thirdly, establishing governance mechanisms for the climate change risk assessments. So first for the strategic planning, uh, this is where you look at doing a risk screening early in the planning phase. So the risk screening looks at assessing the project's local climate projections against a time scale of 2050 and 2090. You're looking at performing a risk assessment of those climate projections and establishing the priority risks that may have a major or minor impact to the community and or project. Uh, the key step two is to develop adaptation measures. So to develop the adaptation measures and um, already spoken to a lot today is how we bring key st stakeholders together and design teams to develop measures to mitigate the climate change risk to the project. And thirdly, that governance mechanism. So the governance mechanism helps us keep awareness, leadership, and it also involves conversation of risk and measures. 
So climate change risk assessments isn't something that you just do and put on the shelf. It's actually a living document that we need to continually revisit. So I have two project examples that I want to share with you today. Um, and again, they're a little bit broader than the Waikato region, um, but it's where climate change risk assessment and adaptation measures have been developed. So the first one is for a small island nation in the central Pacific Karabat. For the island nation, it is occupied by 50,000 people and climate change is a real issue. Where they're affected by sea level rises, fresh water supply, pollution and land availability. What this means is the government is looking for newer, cleaner and higher land to settle over 35,000 residents. To do this, the government has a community master plan underway, which is assess design solutions, such as pumping local sand from lagoons to increase the height of the site, expanding the current waterways for fresh water and natural filtration systems, and then designing the, the master plan so the streets can capture the cool wind breezes as it blows through the, the new village. The other project example I want to share is for the Scott Point Sustainable Sports Park, which is a 17 and a half sports park, uh, sorry, 17 and a half hectare sports park in Hobsonville, Auckland. Now water scarcity and, and a decrease in rainfall was identified as an extreme climate risk priority. So for the Scott Point, this would mean less rainfall for the rainwater harvesting system, reducing the supply for the irrigation demand on site. And to mitigate this risk, the project team have identified the use of an on-site bore as backup and increasing the stormwater capture area for water supply for the irrigation. Now, lastly, before I hand it back to you, Tom, uh, in terms of reducing our carbon emissions for our existing building assets, we are starting to see clients to, um, wanting to understand how much energy their asset uses. So they're starting to look at measuring what their asset is using, benchmarking that, and then reducing that going forward. So they're looking at things like fine tuning plant, um, replacing plant with more efficient plant and also looking at changing fuel sources from diesel gas to more renewable sources as well. So thank you, I look forward to the discussion. Excellent, thank you so much. Well thank you all um, uh, for, your, for your thoughts there and I guess it kind of, I mean it really reinforces the fact that there is a large range of um, stakeholders and people involved and actions already underway, which I guess begs the question, well, how do we ensure that all these actions aren't sort of done in silo? You know, I guess we all have similar goals. Um, so how do, how do we make sure that there's collaboration, that, that, that these plans and these goals uh, overlap and, and, uh, and interact, I suppose? Um, yeah, I'd be interested in, in, in hearing your thoughts on that. Jen, did you want to go first? Yeah, look, I'm happy to go first. I mean, I think that, that partnership and collaboration is a real fundamental part of the work that we do uh, at Council, and particularly in this space, um, whether it's land use or water um, or, um, you know, transport planning, you know, all of these things are done in uh, collaboration with other partners across the region um, and actually Manaki and her team at Waikato Tainui are a really key partner for us in all of this in all of this conversation so I mean I, I think that actually just bringing this conversation to the fore putting out there to the community look this is what our plan is what do you think where are we doing uh, where are we doing enough where could we be doing more you know what where do you want us to focus our investment is a really key part of the conversation and we'll you know we've got a, a long-term plan process coming up soon it'll be a really important part of that conversation with our community um, so in terms of you know a, a, a having a green city that is focused on environmental outcomes is a fundamental priority for our council yeah well Manaki, did you want to talk to that point as well i see uh there was a question that actually came through that you've answered uh in the uh <laughs> in the q a section so for those uh tuning in you can read response here as well but yeah so so how does um Waikato Tainui um engage with others to make sure that I guess that goal of yours can be um 
embedded it more broadly as well. Mm. Look, I think, uh, thanks, Tom. I think, um, as Jen alluded to, I think it is really just about that conversation piece and, and um, the reality is, I guess, all the panellists have alluded to is that climate change is not new, climate change isn't going away. And so I think our responses in our respective areas means that we have to just really get in there and have the conversation. And so, uh, yeah, again, it's, it's really looking at, because ultimately we all have the same goal you know the way in which we get to those goals will be slightly different but the reality is we're all trying to achieve um, and I think every panelist said it around um, you know our adaptation our resiliency um, so I think those key you know those fundamental principles lie uh, within this and so it's not going to be difficult it's just I guess the challenges is how do we make that investment uh, in this not just from a monetary point of view but also from a time you know a time piece and from all of those sorts of things so yeah it, it is just and again from a Waikato Tainu perspective we have a number of levers through our settlements that enable us to ensure that these conversations are happening anyway so yeah I think it's just about that opportunity to really get in have the corridor and then um, as Jen said also um, is that you know where there are areas that are being um, advanced by other key partners, uh, then let's take what resource we have and try and advance another area uh, because that's probably the other thing. Resources are scarce and so we have to be really smart around how we do that. Yeah, and, and just on from that, and, and Manaki, you, you touched on it uh, earlier about how climate change isn't, isn't new for, for Māori. So how do we balance the, I guess, building up of existing knowledge um, on climate change and, and um, mitigation with the need to sort of embrace new ideas and, and um, look for, for new ideas. Look, I probably think Hannah's probably better to answer that. I think she articulated that really well um, in her contribution as a panellist. But again, I think it's, um, yeah, th and there's always been, again, the opportunities there to actually bring mātauranga Māori and science together. Um, and they aren't as far as, par as far apart as we probably think they are. Um, so look, I, 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 again, it's a conversation. I don't think it's that difficult, but again, I... I not that I'm trying to pass the buck, Hannah, I, I do think your response was probably a clear one around how that could happen um, with regards to uh, those balancing acts. So. Kia ora, can I just respond to that? You asked the question, I got, I got all excited. Um, I, I was watching a documentary recently and they talked about how like, um, you know, there's this like, Purako, which uh, I mean, it's hard to translate from today into English, but it's essentially like stories that people um, that are used by Māori and often they relate back to the environment. For example, one explains like this tanifa that when they lash the tail, like the floods come. And so it that using that Purako can demonstrate like where we should build our houses like don't build it by the tanifa because that's where it floods and uh, that's just a very simple demonstration to explain how indigenous people uh like their obligations and, and values are, are different to western values and they live on land the land and therefore gain knowledge from it over intergen uh you know like in intergenerations they feel they have an obligation to the past and the present and, um, you know, their mokapuna their, and their tipuna. So I guess, I, and there's a statistic that like the pop, uh, world's population, 5% um, of the world's population is indigenous, but they protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. So when we look at um, climate change in Aotearoa, we do need to establish um, using like matauranga Māori um, so that for our solutions because they're already there and um, we have been working on this for a really long time and trying to push for these discussions so um, yeah and you know this is like the work that I do also how do we implement you know like to or Waitangi when we um, just did the zero carbon bill 
there was there was a real opportunity for partnership there between you know Pakeha and Māori and we didn't really see that even though when we transition to a zero carbon society it's going to we're going to have to change every aspect of society and if we're doing a partnership as explained by the treaty then um you know like but they're not being involved with the changes we need to make to achieve carbon neutrality even though they have solutions so it's a really complicated um i guess uh like overall discussion to have but um yeah i mean that's that is larger the work i do so i'm glad i could uh, receive the buck. Yeah, and, and I, I guess that leads quite nicely onto a, a point that you touched on as well, Hannah, about the work that we that we do to uh, mitigate climate change also has flow on effects in addressing inequality. And and so um, <laughs> you know how how do how do we make sure that those two go hand in hand? Um, Jen, Amanda, I guess the, the work that you're doing now, does that, does that touch on, uh, I guess, that crossover with, with addressing social issues as well? Yeah, um, I, might, I might jump into that one, Tom. And I saw there's a number of questions in the, in the Q&A around the 20-minute city. And one of the key conversations we've been having about from a 20-minute city perspective is that it does start to... Um, uh, speak to sort of a quality of access to amenity and to workspaces and, and things like that. So um, the 20 minute city is not a new idea, but it has gained some real momentum in the last um, six months. And many of you would have seen um, the news reports where Hamilton put in a quite a lofty um, a request for support through the government stimulus package for an investment in this thing called the 20 minute city um, and really what it is it's it's not really about you know i'm going to start walking and where how far can i get in 20 minutes it's about creating livable suburbs and so that people can get most of what they need nearby where they choose to to have their ha their home, but then everything else that they need, or most of the things that they need, are within an easy walk, cycle, or public transport trip away. Um, and what we've seen um, internationally, and um, Ian White, Professor Ian White from the University of Waikato, has done an amazing job in raising the profile of this conversation. But what we've seen internationally is that it's not a there's no template for this stuff. There's no like, oh great, we're going to do this. Here's the template, whack it in, off we go. That actually the piece of work that we're doing at the moment in this space is really understanding what a 20 minute city means in a Hamilton context. What does it mean for us? What are the things that are really important to the people in our city um, in the context of livable suburbs and accessibility? And yes, absolutely, there are transport projects in that and cycleways and all of that sort of thing but one of the things that's come up for us is easy access to the hour that is such a fundamental part it's the lifeblood that runs through the city it's such a fundamental part of our identity that being close to the river and having easy access to it for its beauty for its function as um as a mode of transport, the cycleway, um, and for recreation purposes, uh, you know, is, is likely to be a kind of a key function of that 20 minute city conversation. But it really is about making sure that, that all of our suburbs, we think about them in that way. What does this suburb need to be more livable, to have more accessibility for all people, and to kind of each start to try and even the playing field in that way. And, and so what's the, the status of that, uh, that idea? Um, so, look, it's been talked about a lot, and one of the priorities of, of our council is, is absolutely to create a city that's easy to live in. And, you know, tw the 20 minute city ethos sort of lives within, within that. We're working uh, with the University of Waikato at the moment to advance the conversation, and, um, and we're hoping that they're going to get some research funding to, to do just that. But um, we're also, uh, many of you will be aware of the new government rules around um, requirements for uh, high growth councils to uh, improve, well, increase the level of density. So the national policy statement for urban development um, is going to require a level of density and a change in the way we think about where that density goes and what that means. So alongside that, we want to have a conversation about if we're going to have 
denser centers, how do we create an environment around that um, that enables livability that um, has a it has a well-being lens and the 20 minute city will be anchored the 20 minute city ethos will be really anchored in that conversation yeah and so amanda can i bring you in here in terms of the work that you're doing is that well-being lens kind of something that yeah. people are coming to you wanting yeah oh absolutely tom um so, so what we're seeing is uh, with the Carbon Zero Act coming out and also the climate change uh, risk assessment being released in the last couple of weeks, is providing a framework for industry to start use to understand um, how they can actually assess climate change and what that might actually look like. Um, but we are getting asked by councils to also look at how do we actually extend that thinking to look at more the quadruple bottom line. So not triple bottom line anymore, it's really that quadruple bottom line where you bring in the social aspects, the well-being, the health, um, livability and affordability are very much um, part of that discussion as well. And so what I see on infrastructure projects and the built environment is that we might use a climate change risk assessment process, but then we might um, pair it up with sort of a multi-criteria assessment and that assessment then allows you to bring in, okay, we're not just looking at the financial benefits now, we're looking at the environmental, we're looking at the social, and we're looking at the health of the community as well and bringing that into conversation. Great, well, and, and then um, we've had a question through um, asking what, what, adv what advice you have for builders and developers wanting to, to get on board with with incorporating some of the ideas highlighted today in, in, their, in their projects. Um, so yeah, what, what advice do you have? And, and um, yeah, I, I don't know, uh, Manaka, if you also want to, to touch on this, on, on I guess uh, the requirements that you, that you have when, when partnering with, with developers and builders as well. Um, yeah, wow, well, look, I think, um I guess, again, I, I would imagine that that conversation, particularly from understanding the resourcing consenting process, obviously that would need to go through the Hamilton City Council. And I think Jen sort of alluded to some of the thinking that the council have around what these new developments might look like and, and, and how can the developers, uh, what their contribution can do, you know, be part of in terms of that. I guess from Waikato's perspective, it's really, pretty simple, um, which is around ensuring that when they are looking at that development, that the, you know, the, um, the access to the water, um, the use of the, the land and its green spaces um, are, are well incorporated into that development, whatever that should look like. So I'm not a technical person myself there, Tom, so I don't know those planning technical terminologies, but I guess from a Waikato perspective, it's really about ensuring that, um, yeah, that those best practices are applied. So if we're looking at access to the water for the infrastructure development, what does that look like in terms of ensuring that um, what water you take out and the, it, is better than the water you put, you know, and the water you, sorry, you put back in is better than what you've taken out. Because the reality is we well and truly know that um, the Waikato River in its entirety is probably not well, she isn't well. Um, and we also know that water, when extracted from her, um, that often when it is returned back into the water, that water is better than what the water that was taken out. So I guess we're just wanting to ensure that there's some real common sense practices that are applied for these developers, regardless of the size or scale of um, those, you know, those um, projects. Um, I think I would I would echo what Manaki is saying. Look, we're we're really really up for having these conversations with builders and developers. Um, if I was going to give some advice, I would say engage early on this stuff um, with your with your council uh, and understand some of the drivers. Like some of the things that Manaki was just talking about in terms of you know our our moral and legal responsibility to the river um, is significant and it's significant in terms of its impact on particularly large scale development um, but in terms of like stormwater attenuation and things like that you know we we are regularly having conversations with developers about how we balance how we balance those things like and the and the um, you know contribution that that developers will pay towards that environmental 
uh, upside for the city. Um, so engage early, come with your ideas. We're, re we're really, really up for it. Um, but I think starting out by, by um, uh, fronting, by front footing, I guess is what I mean, by front footing the environmental outcomes you're trying to drive in your space um, would be fantastic. We'd love to engage in those conversations. Sure, and I'll, I'll just add to that as well, Jen, because that, that is uh, really important, the, the upfront engagement, as well as um, the governance. So how do we governance these things on projects? So then when you have those early conversations, they don't just um, weed away or die out through projects, they actually carry on throughout the project because it is an important part of the, of the agenda and something to respond to. Yeah, because I, I mean, I guess most builders and developers will be aware of their uh, climate obligations in terms of uh, the expectations under the RMA and, and, and building code and all that sort of thing. So, so what's what's your feeling around the understanding of of going above and beyond uh, <laughs> those um, requirements and actually getting into some of the stuff that we talked about today? I think there's varying levels of understanding and um, desire to step in there. And look, you know, I mean, I think that's perfectly natural. The stuff doesn't come for free. Um, but what, where I've seen it work really well is where um, developers and builders have seen a real uh, a commercial upside to creating something that is special and is reaching out to people who really care about this stuff. And that group of people is larger and larger um, all of the time. So, you know, there is a uh, there, there is absolutely a commercial upside to be had when it's when it's done well and done right, and I absolutely believe that there is a demand for it as well. Um, and just quickly going back, I see we've had a follow-up question on the twenty-minute uh, city um, idea and about how it actually um, contributes to a more sustainable city. So, can you can you sort of talk me through um, the argument for that? Yeah, so it contributes in that it makes it easier to live. Um, your a large portion of your life within a walkable or cyclable um, distance from all of the things that you need. So you can walk to the supermarket, your kids can walk or bike to school, um, you've got uh, your sort of key amenities, you've got access to um, parks and open spaces and um, so, so that uh, in terms of just uh, location specific um, sustainability and then from a mode change mode shift perspective in terms of getting people out of their cars and having connected safe off-road cycling and walking infrastructure so that people can get into town and to the, the swimming pool and some of those other things that are slightly further away so it's really about uh, reorienting the way we think about urban regeneration away from where do we put the cars to how do we how do we move people in a uh, more sustainable way yeah just to add to that sorry you know like um as a cyclist in kitty kitty or like i look at cobham drive now and it's just scary it's it's really hard to get around on a bike you need to have skills you need to have like safety gear and you need to have like a chain which um you know i've lost about three and it's just i think when I, i've talked to sarah thompson about this who's really pushed for the 20 minute city um when you f change the shift from like cars to bikes it obviously has um beneficial impacts on everyone and obviously that ch uh change in mode because New Zealanders have the highest amount of emissions per capita. So I think we're in like the top five. So each individual individual is producing more emissions than people compared in other countries. And that is largely due to the way um, environmental planning has worked out and how we're very car reliant and being able to promote people to move around quicker and in a more sustainable way. Um, well, I, I'm really up for it as a cyclist. So yeah. Good one, good one. Well, I'm conscious we're, we're sort of running out of time. So I just sort of might be nice to, um, I guess, round things off with, I guess, each of your thoughts about, let's say, 2050 um, and, and the, the, the future that, that you imagine and um, what, it, what it will take to, to get there. Um, so are we happy to all just go around and, and, and outline our, 
our view of, of 2050 and how optimistic we are that we're going to to get there. Um, yeah, shall we start with you, uh, Manaki? Oh, look, yes, yeah, thanks, Tom. I think just from Waikato Tainu's perspective, it's it's um, it's pretty pretty simple in that it, it will be a big leap of faith um, in being courageous to actually. Uh, you know, make some hard decisions and just get in and do what needs to, to be done. And so, um, you know, yeah, so, so from our perspective, um, yeah, we, we have a vision and it's to get back to the lament or go back to the time that was shared by King Tafio back in 1863. Um, and so we, we have a goal of that's what we want to achieve. Um, but like I said before, I think really from our perspective, it's just a leap of faith and the courage to do what we need to do to ensure that we, um, yeah, that we give the best of ourselves for, for the, the next generation of Waikato Tony, but for Waikato as a whole, as a region. So kia ora. Um, Hannah, do you want to jump in? Uh, yep, sure. Um, 2050. In all honesty, there's two scenarios in my head, and um, I don't like to think about one of them. To me, like extending beyond 1.5 to 2 degrees is, I just, it can't happen. We do need to achieve net neutrality, or um, it's just like, Awful. Obviously, I don't think about it that much for the sake of my mental health. I do worry about this. And, you know, when you understand um, the reality and you learn more about the science and you keep fighting, but there's always the pushback and you feel like you're saying the same thing. But the, the thing that gives me hope is the other scenario in my head for 2050. And that's achieving net neutrality. But as I mentioned before in my presentation, not just reaching net neutrality it's doing that by creating an equitable society and equitable systems for everyone so that the world is more livable more safe more um you know, like better livelihoods better well-being and just um yeah it's really I, I do think we will achieve it because there's no way that we're going to do the other option it just won't happen we, we can't let it so um yeah, to me, 2050 is a beautiful, wonderful place where humans are enlightened and have changed and there's indigenous sovereignty and uh, everyone has access to, uh, you know, well-being. And um, yeah, that's what, that's my, that's the one vision I have for 2050. Awesome. Oh, I really like that. Um, Amanda, do you want to? Sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, it, so, for me, in, in the work that I do, um, what I'd really like to see for us to get to the carbon neutrality by 2050 is um, not only to keep having the conversation, I think advocacy and leadership in this uh, space is really important, um, but I also think it's actually doing as well. So it's taking things and actually putting it into action. Um, and when we put it into action, to do it in a meaningful way in which that we're challenging the normal so we're reinventing what tomorrow looks like and we're constantly challenging that and we're bringing new ways of thinking into what we're actually doing um, to actually get to that outcome by 2050 as well. So I'd like to see us um, not only talking but also doing and I'd also like to see um, 2050, for us to achieve 2050, challenging that, that normal way of thinking and really putting things to the test before we implement them. Sorry, just before, just as a reference, I'll be 36 in 2015, so I'll be young. <laughs> I was about to say something positive about you, Hannah. I'm not sure I will now. <laughs> I'll be well over 36 um, by the time 2050 comes around, but I really hope that I am living in the world that Hannah just described. I think that is um, something that we all should 
absolutely not just be aspiring to, but we must be planning for that. And I think a key, a key way we're going to get there is by not just having these kinds of conversations, but laying down the foundations that will, will enable us to get there one step at a time. I feel really fortunate that um, we are on that journey uh, for in the greater Hamilton area. We have a new thing called the Metropolitan Spatial Plan, which lays out a, um, a transport corridor, mass transit um, space that is that can easily connects people uh, within Hamilton and with the communities outside of Hamilton that will use the city for whatever it is they choose to use it for um, that protects our key soils it protects our greens our green and blue corridors that has a real focus on improving the well-being of the Waikato River um, and really is about livability in a far more long-term sustainable way. Uh, so we just need to keep stepping in that direction. Excellent. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I think that was a really nice way to um, end our discussion here. There's so many more things we could have expanded and uh, spoken about. Um, but unfortunately, that's all we have, have time for today. But um, look, thank you. Uh, Thank you all so much, especially to our speakers, Jen Baird, Hannah Hagen, Manaki Nepia, and Amanda Bryan. We really appreciate uh, you all sharing your time and expertise uh, today. So thank you, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. We uh, will have a recording uh, of this available on our website shortly, um, if you'd like to watch it back or share it with uh, anyone who, who missed it. Um, for those of you who are interested in hearing more discussions like this one, you can uh, check out the full recordings of our World Green Building Week uh, webinars, which we held last week. Um, they're all available on our website, and while you're there, uh, you'll also be able to see all our, um, all our upcoming um, uh, events and webinars as well. Um, but uh, for now, uh, kua, ma uh, kua mutu te kaupapa i tēnei wā. Ka kite ano i a koto, no reira, tena koto, tena koto, tena tato. <laughs>